Whenever you have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will find a, a solution for you. So what happened, subhanAllah, that day, somebody came to the teacher and he said, there's an emergency and you have to go. So what he did, he placed Abu Hanifa rahimahullah in his place and he said, you stay in my place right now. So of course, when he was staying for a month or so, people were coming with a lot of questions and a lot of uh, things that he has to answer. So he was answering to whatever he knows, subhanAllah. So when he, and he was writing down whatever he was doing. So when his teacher came, so he presented to him all the questions and answers. He said, فَوَافَقَنِي So he agreed with me with a lot of them. وَلَمْ يُوَافِقْنِي And he disagreed with me with like 20 of the Masai. 20 of the Masai, or the questions of the Fatawa, he, didn't, he disagreed with him. That did not make that Abu Hanifa and his teacher are going to be enemies. So oh, you don't know anything, how come you say so? Not only that, he still remain his student, but more than that, subhanAllah. Abu Hanifa, by the way, out of respect to his teacher, subhanAllah, he named his own son also Hamad. Not only that, he said, I swear by Allah, that my teacher, he lives away from me, like few blocks away from me, few blocks away from wherever Abu Hanifa lives. And he said, when I sit, I never put my feet to the direction where my teacher lives, out of respect. Although there were differences between both of them, subhanAllah. And there, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Abu Hanifa created for the very first time what we call a school. A school where the people sit and they discuss and they talk. It was not at the time before. Malik, rahimahullah, was a, a teacher, which is the people would come and he would sit and they will, they will teach them and they will leave. But Abu Hanifa created something completely different. He brought people from different field and then all of them are part of the school. And whenever there's an issue, he will put the issue and he will ask them their opinion. And the people will say their opinion. How do you, how do you think? And of course not anyone, not the layman, but the people who are qualified definitely. This is something very important. It's not like anyone could say whatever he won't say, this is my opinion. No, it doesn't work in that way. I didn't mean it in that way. Anyway, so he had his own school. And one time, a traveler was passing by, right? And he was listening and he was watching what's happening between the teacher, an old man, and the students. And the very famous students, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad ibn Hassan, and Zofar, and all those beautiful students, and again, after would be scholars of Islam. So when Abu Hanifa was talking to them, sometimes he would say something and one of them he would say, Akhtat, oh, you made a mistake. He's talking to his teacher. And that person was just looking. Then second time, somebody else said to the teacher again, Abu Hanifa, Akhtat. And then the third time, so the guy couldn't wait. And he said, Mahlan bi Shaykh, how can you talk to the Shaykh in this way? Abu Hanifa said, hold on. No, 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 no. This is the way how we are connecting our class. This is the way how we talk. This is the way how we are. I, I don't want them just to listen and go. I want them to discuss. I want them to say their opinion. There's nothing wrong with that, subhanAllah. And uh, especially, it's, it's very amazing, especially about the Madhab Hanafi, that you will find that two-thirds two -third of the Madhab Hanafi is not the opinion of Abu Hanifa. It's actually the opinions and the ishtihad of his own students, especially Muhammad ibn Hassan, al-Shaybani, and al-Qadi Abu Yusuf. And you will find that in all the books, that this is what Abu Hanifa said, and this is the opinion of his students. And there was nothing wrong with that, subhanAllah. There was definitely nothing wrong with that. This is how they were improving themselves. This is the way how they were used to take and used to give. And that's why Malik rahimahullah used to say, كُلٌ يُؤْخَذُ مِنْهُ وَيُرَدُّ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا صَاحِبُ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ Malik, as we have mentioned before, that his manbar, his place of teaching was in the Rawd al-Sharifa, in the manbar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whenever a question used to be, you say, كُلُّنْ يُؤْخَدُ مِنْهُ وَيُرَدُّ عَلَيْهِ Every single person we could take from him, and we could also reject what he says. إِلَّا صَاحِبُ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ And he pointed to the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he used to be in front of him. He said, except this one, the person who is in this grave, you cannot, you cannot reject what he says. يَا إِوَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدِي اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Oh, you are the one who believes. You cannot put your opinion, your saying, your mind 
uh, your efforts in front of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And sometimes we do. We discuss and somebody said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said so, and Rasulullah sallallahu said so, and you say, yes, but. SubhanAllah, how is that possible? That you are saying in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his kalam and in front of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are saying your own opinion. You put it at the same level or even higher. And that's why sometimes or it happened in the time of Ibn Abbas somebody asked him a question. And he said, he answered, he said, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. And that person responded, he said, but Abu Bakr and Umar said something. Look, Abu Bakr and Umar. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا أَبُوْ بَكْرَ وَعُمَرَ Shaykhan, subhanAllah. And Ibn Abbas, he said, it's almost the, the earth is going to have an earthquake. Oh, it's like it's going to swallow us. أَقُولُ لَكُمْ I'm telling you Allah said, right? And you are telling me Abu Bakr and Umar. Imagine this. This is how the way it used to be. But in the same time, there was always respect between the people. There was nothing called takfir. There's nothing called that we are accusing of the other person that he is ignorant <coughs> and he does not know anything. Again, I'm mentioning again and again and say, it's not just an open box that you know what, anyone could say whatever he wants. No, it's only the people who actually know what to say. Even the fatawa, even the fatawa, sometimes you may find the same person given two different fatwas. And then you may accuse that person and you don't know what's behind it. The very famous story of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu. And one time, and he, uh, Nafi, which is his student, he used to narrate the story. He said, I was in the Majlis of Ibn Abbas, and a person came to him, and he asked him a question. A person that he already committed a crime of killing, does he have a tawbah? Can he repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it possible that Allah will accept from him, and he will forgive him? And Ibn Abbas, he looked at him and he said, didn't you read what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran? In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dalika li man yasha. Allah said openly, clearly, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive everything except shirk to whoever he wants. And the person left. A couple of days probably another person came and he asked him, same question but differently. Say a person, he will, he will use the future tense, he will commit a crime. Will he have a tawbah after that? He said, what are you talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّلًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَلَعَنَهُ اللَّهُ وَغَدِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Whoever killed a mu'min, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّلًا intentionally فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا So he would be in Jahannam forever. وَغَدِبَ اللَّهُ عَلِيهِ Allah will have his anger on him. وَلَعَنَهُ and he will curse him. وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَلَابًا عَظِيمًا He closed all the doors. That there's no tawbah at all. That he will be going to the hellfire. And the person heard that. And he left. And his students asked him. Ya Imam. Same question came to you. He said, no. Didn't you hear what the person said? The very first person who came to me, he asked me. And he already committed a crime. So there's no coming back. So what should I do? Close all the doors for him? I'm supposed to open the doors of Tawbah for him. But the person who came the second time, he is actually thinking to commit a crime. I suppose also to close all the doors for him and not to give him a chance even to think about that. So there's a fiqh offer there. So even those differences that you see sometimes, you have to read behind it. And most of the time, don't think that we know better than the people before us. Don't think that we know be be better than the people before us. Those people who lived before, and they, 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 they give all their life completely for the Islam and for the deen, and we came and we started criticizing them, even without even knowing their hujaj, without even knowing their opinion, without even knowing why they came up with something. At least give yourself the chance to understand what they said and why they said it. And then you will understand, subhanAllah. It's, it's just a question of ignorance or a question of ego. We read a couple of lines, a couple of books, and then that's it, we finish. We think that the ilm is finished over there. And we know everything, subhanAllah. Again, 
I mentioned that the ulama before us, and I mentioned Malik, and I mentioned Abu Hanifa, and I mentioned Shafi'i. And just again, this beautiful person, Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and how he was a student of Imam Malik at a very small age, probably at the age of nine, he was attending the classes of Imam Malik, and he was memorizing, uh, subhanAllah. And he had so much respect for Malik, as he mentioned, he said, I used to be in the class of Malik, and I used to be very careful when I turned the pages, so I would not disturb my teacher. And uh, Malik, he saw that, and he said to him once, subhanAllah, again, this is a very good thing, advice, especially to the young people. And he said to him, uh, Inni ara an Allah, I see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put light, he put light in your heart. So don't turn it off with the darkness of this obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very important. If a person, he sees himself, he's not able to acquire the knowledge, it means that there's something wrong with him, with his ma'asi. And he mentioned also Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, and this is especially those young people, mashallah, that they are doing so beautifully in memorizing the Qur'an. That Shafi'i once he mentioned to his teacher, Waqi' ibn Jarrah, he said, Shakawtu ila waqi'in su'a hifdi, fa'arshidani ila tark al ma'asi. I complained one time to my teacher that I have some problem with memorization. And the problem with memorization is just like the way we think. Actually, when he was attending the class, he heard 20 hadiths and he missed one. So for him, it's a big thing. And he was just memorizing, he's not even writing. شَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيعٍ سُوَا حِفْضِي فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي فَإِنَّ هَذَا الْعِلْمَ نُورٌ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُعْطَى لِعَاصِي You say this ilm of Allah, it's a light from Allah and this light from Allah would not be given to a disobedient person. So this is again another question that sometimes we ask ourselves why I'm not able to do so, why I'm not able to memorize, why I'm not able to read the Quran, why I'm not able even to sit and read few pages, although I'm able to use my phone for hours and hours and hours. Probably something is wrong with you, not with the Quran, not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going back again, I say those differences always used to be among the people. And you used to live in harmony and you used to love each other and they used to respect each other, and they used to praise each other, and they used to acknowledge each other. And one of the barakah of him, by the way, one of the barakah of him, if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah of him in you, that you always have to acknowledge the people before you, and always you have to acknowledge especially your teachers. And this is something that also it's missing from our culture, that the teacher becomes nothing, subhanAllah. Uh, as it mentions, subhanAllah, Qum, this is a very famous uh, verse in Arabic language, and I will inshallah close with it. That it says, Qum lil mu'allimi wa wafihi tabjila, kaad al mu'allimu an yakuna rasoola. Say, stand up and give to the teacher his respect. Almost the teacher was about to be a, a messenger, because all the messenger prophet they used to be what? Teachers. Even Isa alayhi salam, he used to call him also the teacher, subhanAllah. And the best of the teacher and the teachers was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring our hearts together and make us among the people that, as he mentioned, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ To be the best people that we were sent to the mankind to guide them, to help them. Again, I ask Allah to forgive me and forgive all of you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. If you have any comments, I'll be very happy, inshallah. Otherwise, probably your program. We actually have more, more time now. <laughs> okay, good, inshallah. So we'll take a few minutes. Uh, I, I, when, when the Imam was reciting, mashallah, in such a beautiful way, you're so lucky that you have this beautiful person, that we wait for him to come uh, once a year in the Muslim center of flashing, we invite him. May Allah put barakah in you twice. Okay. Yes, inshallah. Zakallah okay. khair. Uh, especially when he was mentioning about the, the women and their rights, and how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded, subhanAllah. It's just a small thing that came to my mind regarding this matter. And especially the way how we we treat, we see, and the way how the people they portray 
about the Islam itself and the women, subhanAllah. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing little story that happened in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anhu Allah. It mentioned in one of the Ghazwa, probably Ghazwa to that Riqa'ah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he used to go for a battle, he would take one of his wives. So this time, it was the time of Aisha radiallahu anhu Allah. She was a young woman, subhanAllah. So when she went with the, with the army, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he realized that she was not really comfortable. So he took her on the side just to make her comfortable and he asked her, what about having a race? Aisha radiallahu anha to race with who? With Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I wonder if any of us could think about this man. You as a very respectful person, pious person, say I'm going to race with my wife. Say, no, no, this is not, you may say this is not right. This is not adab. SubhanAllah. There was no one who had more adab than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And more haya than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And more understanding than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And more fear of Allah 